Hey everybody, thanks for logging in today to watch this webinar on native plants for small spaces. Um, my name is Sarah McHale. I am the community engagement specialist with the Land Conservancy of McHenry County. Um, and today we're just gonna be going through some of our favorite plants for um, small spaces in, uh, in gardens, in your yards. Um, all right this there we go this uh program today is you're going to be sent the recording okay either today or tomorrow at some point um if you have questions go ahead and put them in the q a box and i will go through that at the end and answer them um all right so who is the land conservancy of McHenry county we are a nonprofit land trust located about an hour northwest of chicago in illinois um, we've been around since 1991. What is a land trust? A land trust, we like to preserve and take care of land uh, and also support the landowners who wanna do the same. Um, and we do it in a whole variety of ways from education to conservation easements, to agricultural easements, to working with municipalities and libraries and private homeowners like yourself. Um, we do a spring and fall native tree, shrub, and plant sale, um, rain barrels and composters also, and that is found on our website, conservemc.org. Um, if you are not in McHenry County and you want more information on your land trust, wherever you are, just go to findthelandtrust.org type in your zip code and connect with them, become a member, volunteer, get on their e-newsletter list, whatever it is. But that's how nonprofits exist, is through member support. All right, so let's get started here. What exactly is a native plant? Because you're gonna hear me talking about that a lot. And a native plant is a plant that's lived in a certain region. Um, generally, it's defined as before the region was settled. I don't like that saying that though, because that implies that European settlement was the first settlement and that's not true. Anyway, for a really long time, for thousands of years, <laughs> sometimes these plants have been living there with no human intervention. Okay. Um, and they don't exist as singular entities. They exist as a community, an interconnected community. So this is an example right here. Um, this is from this is me laying on the ground taking the taking a picture of the ground layer in an oak savanna, um, and you can see how it's very dense. There's not a lot of just like open soil. It's covered in different layers, and this whole thing is only a foot tall. So along the bottom, we've got Pennsylvania sedge, which is what looks like kind of this flowy grass. And then above that, we've got mayapple, uh, which is a, a wildflower that's commonly found in uh, oak savannas. And all of these, these are just a few examples of plants that would commonly be found in a variety of different kinds of oak habitats. And all of them have connections through their roots, through fungal connections in the soil, and they actually connect up with the tree roots as well, the oak trees, and they um, exchange nutrients that way. So when you're thinking about planting a native plant garden in your yard, you're really creating a little community in your yard when you think about, you know, putting these plants in. Don't think about putting in, you know, this plant from this community and this plant from this community and and they're completely unrelated communities and expect them necessarily to be able to talk to each other and, and associate. So just plant communities. Why do we care about these native plants? Um, we care about them for a variety of reasons. Uh, pretty much every single native plant is going to feed or support some kind of native wildlife. Um, this is just a simple example here, milkweeds and monarchs. And the monarch uh, butterfly lays its eggs on milkweed, those eggs hatch, and those caterpillars that you see on the left there, 
have a specialist relationship with milkweeds where they are only able to eat the leaves of milkweed plants. Um, they complete their life cycle, go through metamorphosis and you know, eventually become an adult butterfly and the whole thing kind of starts all over again. And there's countless examples of relationships like this that happen. So all different kinds of wildlife support um, through the countless different kinds of native plants. Um, their roots are helping to absorb stormwater. So there's all different kinds of root structures uh, from different kinds of plants. Some of them are real fibrous and hairy. Some of them are deep tap roots and they all kind of exist in the soil in different places and they open the soil up um, and allow it to be like a sponge and absorb stormwater, all right? And that's huge. We, we want stormwater to be able to absorb in place in our yards and not necessarily run away down the driveway or something like that and connect up with the stormwater systems where it picks up pollution as it goes and then it ends up in our nearest body of water. Um, less chemical input. Native plant gardens, they don't need fertilizer. Okay, you don't need to use pesticides or anything like that, really, if you choose not to. Um, if you've got a diverse native plant garden with lots of different kinds of plants that are going to support lots of different kinds of life, you're going to end up with all different kinds of like a whole insect food chain happening inside these gardens and they all can kind of balance each other out. And you actually don't want to use any fertilizers in native plant gardens. Um, it can cause them to just like some of these flowers to just grow really tall and get really floppy and just look really unsightly. So we don't want to use fertilizers and they're just beautiful. All right. Just a really nice, beautiful, alive creation to be able to look at. All right. So where do we start when we're talking about um, putting native plants in a small space? Because even the smallest spaces can support life. And so, you know, what's a small space to me might be different from what's a small space to you. So we're gonna cover a few different options, but there are some, some understory trees that can be used in very small spaces. And we're gonna, so we're gonna start at the top and we're gonna work our way down to the very smallest stuff down at the ground layer. Um, Pagoda Dogwoods, if you've got some shade, Pagoda dogwoods are a good bang for your buck. Sorry, cat, stay over there. Are a good bang for your buck um, as far as supporting pollinators, supporting birds, because they eventually end up with some really nice little berries that birds like to eat. And they're just beautiful. They're not aggressive spreaders either. Um, if you've got the if you've got shade and you've got this a little bit of space for a tree that's going to be 25 feet tall, 30 feet wide. This is a beautiful um, plant to put in almost as like a specimen tree, or it can also be a multi-trunk shrub too, depending on its form. I like, I've seen them planted at the corner of a house. It looks really nice. Um, they would be found out in the woods. They would be found just as an understory tree in some shaded woodlands. Um, they're going to like, they're not going to be happy in really dry conditions, um, but they're going to like medium soil to moist soil. Um, and they really prefer some protection from harsh afternoon sun, if you're able to give them that. Here's an example of it in the winter. My friend Dorothy in her yard in Woodstock, she loves her pagoda dogwood so much right out in front of her house. She puts little ornaments on it, which I think is really cool. Um, here we go, berries, high in fats, and the birds just love to eat these things in the late summer. And those panicles of white flowers are really beautiful and um, provide nectar and pollen for insects as well. All right, so going smaller, We've got um, a shrub option here. It's a good option for foundation plantings, dwarf bush honeysuckle. Um, I like to put this in as a, as a shrub that's just gonna really fully fill a space, a 
okay? And this is a long, narrow space here along the foundation um, where the dwarfbush honeysuckles, which do spread by suckers, as you can see in that little graphic there that demonstrates kind of how they they spread outwards by these like little thread-like roots and then, you know, new little branches kind of form. Um, if you let them do that, they're going to create this kind of nice mass. And so they do sucker kind of out into the lawn and I don't really care because we just run the suckers over with the lawnmower <laughs> and that's how it's controlled very easily that way. Um, they're extremely adaptable, sun, shade. They could do pretty much dry soil to medium soil. They're not gonna be happy in like really, really wet conditions. Um, I've got them here along the foundation in just like this really kind of cruddy foundation fill soil. It's like hunks of clay and rock and weirdness and it's thriving, they're doing great. I think they look really nice when they're massed together, when you just kind of shove like three of them together, spaced, I don't know, three or three feet apart or so, and, you know, let them just kind of fill in. And, and it's nice because then it's like, all right, this is an easy, low maintenance thing that's just going to cover this space here. And that's great. Um, you can prune them in the late winter if you want to. So like now, March is usually when I prune them if I'm going to, and I don't really know the technicalities of how to prune things. <laughs> I just cut them down, down maybe a foot off the ground or so, and they quickly rejuvenate and grow into a nice kind of mounded form. Um, Cool little yellow flowers in June or so, loved by bumblebees. Oh my gosh, the bumblebees absolutely just kind of cover these flowers. And the flowers aren't super showy or anything. Um, but again, it's really nice to see this foundation planting just, you know, shoot, supporting. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> supporting some life there. These cats, I tell ya, these cats in this room. Okay, <laughs> this is the foster cat room as well. Um, all right, so we were here with the bumblebees. And oh, they got really cool winter form as well. Um, the way they branch out and catch the snow on them, I think it looks really, really nice in the winter. And when something also looks nice in the winter, as well as in the spring and the summer and the fall, that makes me really happy and really, really like that, especially for a small space. It's important to choose plants that you put in a small space that are, that are gonna have multi-season interest because you don't have a lot of room for tons of different options. Okay, New Jersey tea. Um, so this is a shrub that has some pros and cons. Um, it is good for small spaces because it is not an aggressive spreader at all. And it is short. So, you know, four feet tall, it can get five feet wide. Um, it could do sun to part shade. It really likes dry soil. It'll do fine in medium soil too. Um, just covered in all different kinds of pollinators around like late June, early July. The thing is, is that in some parts of my yard, and I have friends who've had the same thing happen, um, sometimes rabbits really like to chew on these things. They like to girdle the base of them, especially over the winter. So they'll fade out, you know, and maybe won't grow the year after they got kind of girdled by the rabbits. And then maybe the year after that, they're going to re-sprout potentially. Um, and they're not going to consistently have this big, beautiful form to them. So if that bothers you, uh, don't put this shrub in like a focal place, all right? Put it in a garden where the years where it's not going to bloom or grow leaves or look alive at all. It's just kind of gets covered up by other plants. 
Okay, so now we're going to talk about some of some of the herbaceous plants and our ground layer. And um, for small spaces, you've got to think, what is my goal for that small space? Is it, I just need some plants to cover the ground <laughs> and to take up space? And I don't need a ton of diversity in here. And really, I just want plants in here. So it'll take up space and I don't have to do a ton of weeding. Um, and if so, and that's fine, if that's, you know, if that's your goal, a plant like Canada anemone is potentially a great option for that because it stays low. It stays under a foot. It gets beautiful white blooms on it in I don't know, June, July, probably something. It's like the earlier part of the summer. Um, it can do medium to medium wet soil. Uh, it can do sun, it can do partial shade and it's going to spread prolifically. And I mean, you put like a half dozen of these plants in and it's just gonna within two years cover a whole space if it's bare soil. And in some cases, that's great. You know, if you just don't feel like dealing with filling that whole space. So this is a decent, I don't want to call it a ground cover because to me, ground cover implies that it's able to withstand some level of foot traffic. And this plant can't handle that. It cannot handle you just like running wheelbarrows over it and constantly walking on it and stuff like that. Um, but it is good as a short plant to cover a bunch of space if a lot of different plant diversity is not your goal. If your goal in a small space is lots of different kinds of plant diversity, you can do that, okay? You could still do that. A small space doesn't have to limit you that way. And um, so there's, if you read like design books and stuff, they're gonna say in a small space that you need to limit the number of species that exist in a small garden. And you can, you can do that. You can limit, you know, if you've got like a narrow sidewalk garden like this, you can narrow it down to like five species of plants or something. But personally, a, I've broken that rule like a bunch of times in this garden, especially. And this is one of my favorite gardens on my entire property. And I think the reason visually that it works so well, in my opinion, for me, is that the number of things blooming at one time are limited. Okay, so the background color is green. That's kind of like your supporting foundation is green. But then we've got oranges and yellows and a tiny bit of white that are really taking the show. Um, and this is like late June, early July, where it's looking like this. And so there's actually a ton of different kinds of plants in here. I don't know, there's more than 25 different species of plants in this garden in and of itself um, in different places. But when you look at what is forming the foundation in this picture itself, you could see those three main colors, all right, are what we're looking at. So the orange is butterfly milkweed, the yellow is prairie coreopsis, the white is um, some of those little New Jersey tea shrubs, some of the green things, the flowy grass is prairie draft seed, and then along the ground layer, along the base, we've got a combo of prairie smoke and common violets. And honestly, the violets just seeded themselves in there and I just let them do that all over the place because I don't want bare soil. <laughs> I don't want to weed things. And bare soil, large expanses of bare soil just kind of invites that. So I don't want to deal with that. Um, all right, so some tips that are especially applicable to small spaces are um, planting, knowing about the root structure of some of these plants. So instead of, like I've heard people say, I will never put a plant in a small garden that spreads by rhizomes. 
And so there's a diagram of what rhizomes are there. And that's prairie coreopsis that the arrow is coming from. It's not blooming. It doesn't have the pretty yellow blooms on it yet. Um, so those are the rhizomes, those thread-like little roots. And then next to it, actually flanking it on both sides, is a bunch grass, is prairie drop seed. Do you see how different those root structures are? And so you don't need to limit yourself by saying, like, I'm never going to put a rhizome spreader into a small garden because they're going to aggressively take over. If you do it in a smart way and just kind of sandwich these rhizome spreaders in between bunch grasses, that dense root system there of that prairie drop seed, when those rhizomes hit that, they just kind of stop. They stop spreading. It's great. Because at first, I was like, oh no, what, what's going on here? Because the prairie drop seeds, when you put them in as a little half pint plug, they take like three years or something to really get growing. They take a long time. So in the meanwhile, the prairie coreopsis is, is like spreading and spreading and spreading. And then eventually though, those prairie drop seeds caught up and the root system really got robust and developed and the prairie coreops just stopped. I'm like, oh, look at this. So we're just gonna stop these shallow rhizome spreaders with the root system. And plus it looks nice above ground. When you have the fine textures of grasses, like the prairie drop seed, um, to balance the coarse textures of some of these wildflowers, like the prairie coreopsis. So you can do rhizome spreaders even in a small space. All right, cool season ground covers. This is a fantastic topic that could like be its own program. So what do I mean by a cool season ground cover? Violet is an example. Um, it's a plant that is going to green up and start growing actively when the soil is cool still. So and when the air temperatures are cool. So in the spring, um, and then also potentially in the fall. And the reason I like this is, especially in a small garden, is because they outcompete weeds that also like to prolifically grow in the cool season. <laughs> Things like dandelions and all kinds of other weeds love growing during the spring, April, May, early June. So if we have prolific cool season ground cover plants that we just kind of let seed all over the place and grow like this and cover the soil, they're going to provide a lot of competition for weeds. That's great. That's just what I want. All right. These violets, meanwhile, are supporting all different kinds of insects. Awesome. Just what I want. Violets can handle some sun if they've got some moisture. So if you've got some medium soil to like medium wet soil, if you've got really dry soil, they're not gonna do so great um, in full sun, but they can do shade as well in a whole variety of soil conditions. I like them, they're little, they're short. That's a big thing that I like for small spaces is tending towards short, although I'm gonna break that rule in just a minute and show you some other examples. Um, and they just look really pretty too. So common violets, not just a lawn weed, guys. These are great little plants for your gardens as well. And you really only put a couple in and within a few years, you're gonna end up with a bunch of them. Um, pasque flower, such a little beauty. Okay, this is a, wildflower of the prairies, of the wide open prairies, blooms in April. Before pretty much any of the wild open prairie plants even think about existing and growing, <laughs> pasque flower is going and it's like six inches tall. It's just, just incredibly tiny little thing. And can you see the hairs on it? Um, that's an adaptation that helps it withstand extreme cold still in April, cold wind, um, really kind of harsh conditions still. I mean, we can, I've seen this plant get covered up with snow 
you know, while it was blooming and then like the snow, you know, in April, it like melts the next day and grass flower is doing fine. Still there, the blooms open back up. Um, it's so since it's a prairie, you know, it's a prairie species, it's going to like sun. It's going to like some dry to medium soil. I like to plant this in like the very edge of a garden um, where it's not going to be just totally covered up by crazy tall, you know, stems and everything. I like it on the edge where I can really just sit and appreciate it and be able to watch it. So there's a lot of early bees that are just starting to come out in April um, who like this one as well. And it's cool to watch them. Another um, cool season ground cover plant that's kind of a, a workhorse in the garden along with violets is prairie smoke. Now this is not gonna spread as pro prolifically as violets at all. Violets like catapult and fling their seeds. So they spread a lot um, and ants carry the seeds around too. Prairie smoke is different. It's, it's a rhizome spreader, but like super slowly, okay? Um, if I dug down through the snow in January, I would find prairie smoke leaves just like on the ground. To me, that's really impressive. I love plants like that, that are going to, even in the middle of winter, they're going to have a presence and they're going to be covering the soil and they're going to helping to prevent soil erosion and hold moisture in the soil. Perfect. Awesome. Love it. And they're just like super pretty. Under a foot, tall, cool pink flowers that dangle down. Um, bumblebees like to hang on the bottom of them and they like pry the blooms open and go up inside there and shake their bodies. It's called sonication. And they like dislodge pollen that way. They like some sun. Um, they're gonna bloom in May. And then in June, when they're done blooming and they're going to seed, this is when I think they look the coolest, is when they develop the flower part, you know, disappears, the petals disappear and the seeds are really formed. And if you, each one of those little wispy things there is called an akeen. If you tug on it and the seed is ripe, you'll see the tiny little seed attached to the end of one of those wisps, um, similar to a dandelion. Right. So think about when you're a kid and you would blow on the dandelion and they would just fly all over the place and the seeds are attached to the end of those. Same dispersal method for prairie smoke. Um, when you get a mass of prairie smoke that has all of these wispy akeens at the same time, it makes a pretty cool visual impact when you see that. Um, and it's a workhorse plant too, and that it's really going to help suppress weeds, especially if you plant it as a consistent matrix throughout your garden. These can be split. Um, you could split them in the fall really is a good time to do it and just move them, you know, all around in your garden. And uh, they do really well with that. Okay, blue-eyed grass. So this is one I wouldn't necessarily consider a ground cover like the prairie smoke and the violets, but it's just a really cool little plant to have in a small space. Um, again, it's under a foot and can be just covered in these blue, bluish purple blossoms. It's not a grass, it's actually in the iris family. The common name is just super confusing. Um, blooms in May, spreads pretty slowly by little rhizomes and it'll seed around too, which that's awesome. Look at it. Who doesn't want this to just seed all over the place in your garden, right? And like cover up space. It's really just a really beautiful pop of kind of purple blue, full to part sun, dry to medium soil. It's not gonna like really wet conditions. Okay, prairie flax. I love this one. This is another one that catapults its seeds. Um, all right, so it blooms in June. Fold apart sun, dry to medium soil. This is a this is a prairie species here. 
it stays under two feet. Now, everybody like, or whatever, in the summer, you start to hear all these people talking about how they love the flocks that's growing along the sides of the road, along the sides of the highway. And oh, look how pretty it is. Chances are it's the invasive Danes rocket. This is a true flux species. It's got five petals on it. If you count the petals, one, two, three, four, five, five letters in the word flux. Okay. Dame's rocket is going to have four petals on it. It's going to be a similar color, four letters in the word dame. Okay. So that's a good way to remember that. I've also heard people say high five is a good thing. So these little flock species with five petals on them. Yay, that's the good one. Okay, anyway, this prairie flock um, makes a stunning visual impact from when you stand back and you look at it from a far, you know, far distance away when it's in bloom because it's a really magenta pink color and it's just beautiful. Um, this one just kind of catapults around like in July when the seeds are ripe it just shoots them out and so like you're gonna randomly maybe find this growing somewhere it does not spread aggressively I wish it did that'd be amazing when I find it growing somewhere I don't want it to grow like you know if it's in a walkway or something like between flagstone stepping past where I know it's just gonna get trampled super easy to just dig them up and move them. You know, these are really easily transplanted. Oh, harebell. Oh, this one is so cool. So some of these, like I've been out at Star Rock State Park and I've seen this extremely diminutive little delicate looking plant growing in the craziest places out of rock crevices in the side of like limestone. And I've been in the Rocky Mountains, just up in the mountains and there's like no plants. And here we've got harebell growing out of the side of like a rock cliff or something. This plant is amazing how tough it is. Don't let its tiny thread-like, you know, stems and small blooms fool you. This is a tough plant here. Fold apart sun, dry to medium soil, foot tall. Um, it blooms in like June or July, but sometimes it'll like randomly start re-blooming sometimes in like August or September. That's cool. So this is a neat one that I like to, again, have along the edges, kind of, you know, along the edges where I can really see it and it doesn't have massive amounts of tall competition. Nodding Wild Onion, this is a good one for small gardens under two feet tall. Um, it does the the leaves so it's an onion it's an allium those allium leaves green up really early in the spring i like that when things start greening up in like april um so you can really start to see some life in your garden and they form their nodding form to them at the ends there by the blooms i that to me is so interesting i love the way that looks when they curve like that. Um, and then in like July, they're going to uh, get those cool, cool just blossoms on them. These do fine both in the middle of the garden and on the edge. They do good like that. They're gonna seed around a little bit, not super aggressively, you know. You guys are probably getting like the point here. When things seed into a place where you don't really want them to be, don't ever hesitate to just move them, edit them, transplant them, give them to a neighbor, compost them, rip them out. Like it's your garden. Okay. It's your space. Make it look the way you want it to look. Cause really you put these plants in and they're going to support life. <laughs> they really are. So don't feel guilty. Um, about not letting something overwhelm the space if you don't want to. Purple prairie clover, this is another real well-behaved sun plant. Um, stays under a couple feet tall and just gets these really brilliant purple uh, blooms on them in July. Um, it was, this picture is 
the one on the right, that's purple prairie clover, that purple that you see that's paired up with the allium. The nodding wild onion, I think it looks really cool together. Okay, so then a fall bloomer to support insects in the fall, like our migrating monarchs, aromatic aster. So remember back to that rhizome graphic that I showed you with the um, prairie, what was that? The prairie coreopsis. This is another rhizome spreader, okay? And so with these rhizome spreaders, you, you've got a choice. And it's kind of like in the beginning where we talked about what's your goal for the space? Is it tons of diversity and lots of different kinds of plants? Or is it just plants, please just fill the space? So with the aromatic aster, it's a rhizome spreader. I just let it fill the space, you know? So I do have it in some gardens with uh, other plants, but they're like, I put the aromatic aster as an anchor where it can just, you know, fill an entire end of a garden, an entire corner, just let it do its thing. And when those rhizomes spread out of the garden into the lawn, guess what? They get ran over with the lawnmower and it's really easy to control them that way. This is one of my favorite asters for landscaping purposes because it forms a dense mounded shape as opposed to some asters that are like, tall and leggy and don't look nice at all when they're not blooming, all right? And they can give a garden a really weedy appearance. This plant, even when it's not blooming, just a nice mounded kind of form to it, not real leggy and sticking all over the place. When it is blooming, it's incredibly stunning. This is in September, okay? Um, Bees love it, butterflies love it, like the monarchs are all over it in September. It's really cool to watch it. Oh good, I do have this picture. Yeah, so in the winter, it's really neat because it stays upright in this mounded form. It's almost like a shrub, okay? The stems are, are almost pretty woody. It's really interesting. I mean, it is an herbaceous plant, but it maintains its mounded form in the winter and it catches the snow and it looks gorgeous. So again, when you've got something that can maintain its form through the winter, especially in a small space, um, that's going to give you a nice kind of design impact as well, which is great for small spaces. Okay, so so far I've been talking about a lot of short herbaceous plants. I want to talk about some tall stuff for small spaces and some things that I do like for small spaces and taller things like four to five feet tall. Um, this is two examples here. So Culver's Root and Rattlesnake Master. Culver's Root is the white candelabra looking guy on the left there. And Rattlesnake Master is all the way to the right. And um, is related to a yucca. A lot of people are familiar with what yuccas look like and gets these really interesting branched ball-like um, flower heads on them. So these two stay upright. They are not tall plants that necessarily are just like crazy floppy and lay all over the place. They maintain an upright structure even in the winter, which is really nice, especially for a small space. And huge pollinator supporters. <laughs> okay, these white colored flowers, just holy cow, just tons of different kinds of insects all over them in the summer. Um, Culver's root is not gonna be okay for dry soil, medium to moist. And Rattlesnake Master likes it dry to medium. So if you've got some medium soil, great. You can pair these together, medium, just kind of loamy black topsoil. They'll do fine together, okay? They're both best in full sun. Now, for shade, there's so many shade options for small spaces. This is a tiny little, I don't know how big this is, less than 10 by 10. It's less than 10 by 10, probably more like six feet by six feet, little space right outside my front door that's shaded by a crab apple tree. Um, 
everything's under a couple feet and there's a lot of species in here. I don't know how many there are. I'd say at least 15 to 20 different species of plants are in here. But the base of it is wild strawberry and Jacob's ladder. Okay. Those are the two that kind of make a matrix throughout a lot of the planting. But what's happening, and it's really interesting, the wild ginger and the blood root, they're in the back there. Um, over time, those are spreading slowly and they're overtaking the wild strawberry, which spreads by the crazy runners and that bluish Jacob's letter. So it's interesting to see how things are slowly changing over time. And, um, you know, it's your job is, well, not job, but your privilege as, as the gardener to watch those changes happen over time and to like lead them, you know, just watch where it's going and then be like, oh, we're going to favor you towards more Jacob's ladder, you know? So we're going to, we're going to move some of that ginger out of the way. So the Jacob's ladder has some space to be able to spread into this empty area or something like that. It's all individual choices by you when you're kind of editing what the overall space looks like. Those little anemones down there in the bottom. You guys, I can't even like talk about that plant. It's so amazing. So I like, there's a step right there and I sit on that step and it faces east and I have my coffee in the morning and those little anemones, the rue anemone and then the little early meadow rue too, which does not get like flowers on it at all. I mean, it does, but they're like green and you can't really see them. I sit there and those plants are so incredibly delicate. And this is a place of like serenity for me. It's very shaded and quiet and um, calm. And it's just a place to watch all these tiny bees do their thing in there, you know? And these small spaces can have a big impact on, on you too, you know, for you to have a space to be able to sit like that and just relax and kind of breathe and either start or end your day in a certain way. So cultivate these small spaces like in places around your property that are meaningful to you and that um, are accessible to you on a regular basis. So layers are important. I've talked about that and there's different ways to do layers within these gardens, but the whole goal is like, things that green up early in the spring. And then you've just got it, this like building kind of crescendo of plants throughout the season. Um, and you need to fill those niches in time. You need to fill the root system in all different ways under the soil. You need to fill the space above. We are not looking for expanses of mulch, okay? We're looking for green living mulch in these plants. So you could see I've got a variety. I've got those little rue anemones and I've got the little strawberry in there. And then on the very bottom, very bottom, there's tiny, tiny little seedlings. And I'm not going to rip those out. I don't even know for sure what those are, <laughs> honestly, from this picture. But it's a wait and see thing. I have a feeling those are going to turn into potentially more little rue anemones. Don't know for sure, but probably. All right, so speaking of layers, Pennsylvania sedge, and there's a bunch of other kinds of carrots, other kinds of sedges um, that are fantastic for small spaces, okay? This is one that's pretty well behaved, and so it's great for small spaces. It is going to spread slowly by little rhizomes and creep out and form a nice mass for you, but does not prevent other plants from growing up in between it. All right, pretty much all of these plants that I've talked about today, except for that Canada anemone. <laughs> that one, there's not a ton of plants that grow up through that one. I mean, they can, but not in most spaces. Okay, so anyway, all the rest of them though, 
you're able to get other plants kind of grow up nicely through them. They just create the backbone. Pennsylvania sedge is a backbone plant. This is a plant that would have um, been prolific in our oak woodland ground layers, okay? And when I do site consults for oak landowners, any time of the year we're walking through their woodland, this is what I am looking for. I am looking for little leftover patches of sedge. And, and sometimes that's indicative of like, oh, we've still got some soil quality here. We've still maybe got some insect life happening. Something is happening right here. This is a good place to possibly start some restoration. Anyway, you can use them in your gardens too, okay? Um, stays under a foot. Uh, they spread really slowly by rhizomes. They do get... Do I have a picture of it? No, they do get this tiny bloom. <laughs> it's not, I'm laughing because it's really not much of a bloom. That's got little yellow spiky things that come out of it. Um, the tip of it in like April or something like that. Dry to medium soil, full sun. They can do full sun. They can do shade. They're super adaptable that way, which I love. I love when I see people who plant oak trees or like a, that pagoda dogwood I talked about or like a service berry shrub or something and they under layer the whole thing with just a ground, just a whole ground layer surround that tree with a sedge. It is stunning, okay? Both from a design perspective and an ecology perspective. This plant has really fibrous kind of roots to it it's gonna hold your soil in place. It's gonna cover your soil, hold moisture down in there. I mean, this plant is just, it doesn't, it's not the showiest plant, but from a function standpoint, it shines. It does a ton, okay? So I try to stick this thing all over the place, pretty much anywhere I can. And there's a bunch of other shade sedge options. Um, that I listed there in the left. And you can really just plug these as a matrix all through your garden and then have like, you know, you can have little drifts of flowers throughout them. Oh, bloodroot. I love this plant. Okay. This to me is like Easter. They're usually blooming around the middle of April at some point. Um, woodland, little shade, flower. Uh, spread by ants who move the seeds and the seed has this little like white worm looking jelly thing attached to it called an eliasome and really it's just like fatty protein and the ants want that eliasome so they take the seeds they put them in a little chamber under the soil surface and they eat the eliasome they discard the seed and in like a part of their ant chamber that has like dead ant bodies and excrement and stuff in it. And it's the perfect fertilizer for these little blood roots to grow. And so it's really neat when you start seeing blood root pop up in random parts of your yard or garden. Like who doesn't want this just spreading all over the place? And the leaves look really beautiful as well once the blooms fade. The leaves are really beautiful as well. So like, who doesn't want that? You know, let it spread all over the place. Thank you, ants. Okay. Uh, ginger, this is a great one. Um, really dense, like super dense. This one grows so densely that it can even outcompete like patches of garlic mustard and stuff aren't gonna necessarily come up through the ginger. That's great. Heart-shaped leaves kind of a weird flower that you see in the left there. Um, you like have to go on a treasure hunt to like find the flower. <laughs> it's kind of neat. You just gotta like move the leaves aside and the flower just like lays in the ground. And apparently these flowers that like have this deep red color like that are to attract insects that might normally be attracted towards the super gross like dead animals. Okay. Anyway, I probably just ruined this plant for you, but <laughs> it's a really neat, 
really neat plant in its form from a design perspective. It doesn't smell weird at all. Um, I tell people it's kind of like the native hosta, even though it's like not related to hostas in any way. Hostas are non-native. Um, the form is similar, stays really low, grows really densely. Deer are not going to bother them. Okay. Um, it's a great option to, if you have like oaks in your front yard and you just want to do like a little ring of a, you know, planting around them, there you go. Plant some ginger around it. These are all plants that would have historically grown with our oaks for thousands of years. Okay. They are, uh, they're friends, they're community members. The technical botanical term is their associates. All right. So they all exchange nutrients. Oh, woodland flax. Oh, gosh, all of these little spring plants. I love them for the shade. Um, really. So here's another flax. So the other one I showed you was the pink prairie flax. So that's open in sun. Here's a little shade option. Uh, woodland flax. So flax de barricada. And you can see the five little petals on it. Um, just gorgeous little light purple guy under a foot. And then here's a non-flower, maidenhair fern. Super beautiful, delicate, uh, nice fern that's beautiful when it's massed with a bunch of other maidenhair fern. And it just kind of grows up through the ground layer, whether it's Pennsylvania sedge or strawberry or whatever. And it just kind of gracefully, delicately arches over them. This is a really airy textural plant that makes a really cool visual impact and kind of delicately like dangles and moves in the wind. Love it. Okay, geranium and columbine. Cool plants to find uh, together out in nature and in your garden. These are a little bit taller depending on how rich your soil is, like somewhere between three and five feet. I've seen insane columbine in some people's yards get like just crazy tall. Normally they're going to be around three feet. So geranium is going to be a consistent perennial plant that comes back. That's the light purple one, comes back year after year after year. And they catapult and fling their seeds. Um, they support cool little specialist bees who are like, I only want to get pollen from plants in the geranium family. Columbine on the other hand is not a consistent perennial plant. Okay, it's, I think it's known as like a short-lived perennial. So that means that when it drops its seeds, um, if there's some kind of soil disturbance when it's dropped its seeds, it likes that. And, and you're going to find a bunch of new columbine growing in that area. And I found this in some of my gardens, places where I've like, let's say I've pulled, see, there's like a random cluster of like Canada thistle or something. And I keep pulling it out, pulling it out. And I'm pulling by the roots. Um, if I do that, I'm creating a soil disturbance. And if there's a bunch of columbine seeds there, they're going to grow in that spot next year. That's pretty cool. I like seeing that. Um, so if, if there is no soil disturbance, they'll fade out over time. All right. So you got to just kind of enjoy the discovery of like finding combine in random places. If it's growing somewhere, you don't like it. You just move it. Pretty simple. All right. Yellow pimpernel. This is another one. Or uh, it can do full sun, but it can also do shade. This is another oak savanna plant. A lot of these are can handle a whole wide variety of sun conditions. So delicate. This one, I rarely see people using this in a garden. And I think that needs to change. It's really similar to what looks like golden Alexander. So golden Alexander is like the sun prairie version um, in form, they're not related. This one here, the yellow pimpernel is generally found more in like the oak savanna to oak woodland kind of habitat, a little bit more shaded, just beautiful. So incredibly delicate. Okay. Three-ish feet tall. It's going to give you some yellow blooms in like June in the, in the shade 
where there's not a ton of color happening in a shade garden in the summer. So this will give you that along with incredibly delicate little leaves. And it's like, I'm a little firework is <laughs> how those blooms just remind me. I love this one. And then Starry Campion is another one that's going to give you some color in a shade garden in the summer. So this is a July bloomer. There's not much that blooms in the shade in July. Okay. So Starry Campion is going to be under under four feet tall um, in a shade. It could do full sun too. It could do partial shade. Um, it's going to be happiest with medium wet to not totally dry soil. So like a little bit more moisture. Um, very well behaved. Love this one. And then a well behaved late summer bloomer is blue stemmed goldenrod. Okay, which can do part shade to shade, medium to medium dry soil, three feet tall. And you know what? It's a well-behaved goldenrod, which you can't say very often. Most goldenrods are in just crazy aggressive in a garden setting. Um, and this is one with this kind of delicate arching habit that doesn't spread crazily, all right? And it is native to Northeast Illinois. Okay, so what time is it? Oh, all right, I'm gonna go too long here. Maintaining your gardens is just super important, especially in a small space. Um, yeah, because we want to like, you know, maintain it from looking like some just insane, out of control, crazy wheat patch, right? You want to be like good ambassadors for what native plants can look like in a yard setting. And there's a few tricks that you could do with maintenance. Um, minimizing soil disturbance is one way to minimize weed seed germination. So what I mean by soil disturbance is like what I talked about just a little bit ago where I was like, if I'm pulling dandelion or thistle or whatever out by the full root and you like just churn the soil up that way, you're bringing weed seeds to the surface, all right? Now in my columbine example, it worked because I had columbine seeds in there waiting. But if you don't, and it's only weed seeds, guess what? That's what's gonna grow in that disturbed space is just more weeds. So we minimize the soil disturbance with um, some kind of hoe. That's how we're gonna weed out an area. Instead of pulling the weed by the root, we're gonna cut the stem at the surface of the soil with whatever tool you like. Those stand-up ones are nice for folks who have like bad knees or bad hips or something or a bad back you can stand up and do it. Uh, the little small handheld one, those things are super cheap on Amazon, okay? Or you can get like a quality one too. Um, I use those little small ones a lot in my established gardens that are like more than three years old where everything's kind of filled in because I'm able to do fine little editing work with it that way. Um, with your gardens, maintain a neat edge. Don't let plants, you know, super flop all over the place. Just like maintain a, a visual edge to it. It's going to help it maintain a certain look. Leave your leaves in the garden. If you have to cut stems in the spring, let me see. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about this too. If you have to cut stems in the spring, um, leave them 15 inches tall at least. Research has shown that the little insects that overwinter in stems are going to be in the first 15 inches. Okay, so leave those stems standing um, so that those insects don't lose their habitat. You can also burn tiny, small native plant gardens if it is legal where you live <laughs> and if you know how. <laughs> so we do actually coming up April 2nd, we do a burn class for landowners um, on how to safely do a prescribed burn, how to get the permit in Illinois. It's a free permit to be able to do it. Okay, so sign up for that class on our website. It's the first Saturday in April. Um, so yeah, I burn all of my native plant gardens. And I they don't like burn 
completely a hundred percent. You know, some years there's like big wet patches in some of them and that patch doesn't burn and cool. Then it's not harming the insects in that area or, you know, there's stems that are still standing and it's never a complete annihilation of the area. So there's plenty of undisturbed patches where things survive like insects and stuff. And then we run our conservation at home program. This was originally started by the Conservation Foundation, which is a land trust to the south of us um, in like DuPage, Kendall, Will, Kane counties. Basically, this is a program that encourages people to put some native plants in your yard, start to remove invasive plants. We come over, we do a site visit for you. Um, if you've got some native plants and you're working on removing invasives, you get a sign. Okay, which is a really cool way to encourage other people to create a little pocket of habitat in their yard. And if they see it in your yard and it's, you know, maintaining a certain nice look, you're going to encourage other folks to do this as well. And then to be able to, you know, support the insects in their yards too. Um, more information is on our website. I do the site visits. I've got some amazing volunteers that do the site visits too. Who have just like combined decades and decades of experience with native plants and they're an amazing resource. The fee for the site visit um, is $35. If you are a member of the Land Conservancy, if you are not a member of the Land Conservancy, it is $75 and it includes a membership. <laughs> and then you get a discount if you buy plants from us in our plant sale. Um, okay, so here's a bunch of resources. Where to buy plants if you live up here where I live? Um, if not, here's places where you can mail order, get some native plants shipped right to you. Different books that I really like um, that are good, both for explaining like gardening techniques as well as uh, the connection between the plants and the insects and the birds and all the wildlife in general. We run a Facebook group called Learn, where we encourage folks to post questions about their native plant gardens and restorations. Um, some Instagram pages to follow that show interesting native plant stuff. I like the iNaturalist app for plant identification. It's free, it's really simple to use. And with that, I am going to look in the Q&A box and see if we've got any questions. Tom wants to know what types of edging do I like to use? So Tom, I've tried the black plastic edging um, because somebody just like gave me a roll of it. And so I tried it and I hate it. <laughs> First, it breaks my string trimmer string things all the time. That's annoying. The lawnmower hits it that's annoying too. So really, what I really like is no material as an edge. We use a spade and just cut an edge, okay, if I want that. Um, in some places, I don't have a cut edge, and it's literally the lawnmower that's just going and it's just cutting plants down that are creeping out of the garden and a lawnmower and a string trimmer and that's what's maintaining the edge so it depends on if you want that cut like bare soil edge we just use a spade for that because it's like the lowest maintenance thing to do and then even more low maintenance than that is just using the lawnmower or string trimmer a physical product I mean I guess there's a few places actually if we look, there's a few places like here where I've got pieces of flagstone just to kind of give the garden a little bit of structure. Um, I guess that creates a tiny bit of an edge, but I don't have that all over the place because that's hard to weed around if you've got a ton of that, you know? Um, so really, oh, in the places like this is a garden where I do maintain a spaded edge around it to keep like crabgrass and stuff from creeping in there from the lawn. And this hoe, the stand-up hoe, 
that Sneebauer Royal Dutch hoe. I've got that one and I use that. And the edge of my garden that we spade out, see that little edge there that I'll spade out? It's the same width as that hoe. <laughs> so it's super easy for me to just go through really quickly and regularly to just kind of hoe that cut edge. But if you don't want to do that, like you don't have to, you can just let the plants creep to the very edge, but just know that they're going to creep in from the grass too. And that's a little bit annoying. So Tom, long answer, sorry. Um, long answer, I don't like a physical product as an edge. Okay. Falcon Green, looking to do a football field sized area. Cool, full sun, has grass now, but looking to make it natural and native again. Any advice? Okay, so Greg, Craig. Okay, Craig, I guess your name is. That's not considered a small space. I would, can, I would, I would tell you to use seed for that. That's a whole different process than what we just went through. Um, if it's like more than a thousand square feet, uh, like seed is a totally viable option. I've got a whole recorded webinar on our YouTube channel. Um, what is it called? It's called like lawn, converting lawn to wildflower meadow from seed. I don't know. The recording is on our YouTube channel, Land Conservancy of McHenry County. Um, that goes through the whole process of how to do that. Because I've done that in sections of my lawn too. I'm on like year seven now of certain areas where I just killed the lawn and seeded it with a native plant seed mix. And there's some tricks that you really got to do, but I would suggest watching that recording um, to kind of learn what to expect. Prairie Moon Nursery also has some really great resources on their website. Let me see if I can go back here. Prairie Moon Nursery, I think I've got their website on my resource list. Yep, here we go, prairiemoon.com. They've got some great resources about seed and are a great place to buy seed mixes from as well. Um, Sarah, go ahead and break the rules. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, good. I'm glad you like the violets. Please also visit naturalgardennatives.com, find plant info and where to buy info for local garden centers. That's cool. How close to a service berry would you plant pen sedge? Right up to it, like right up to the trunk, as close as I can get it. That's how close I would plant it. Can you participate in conservation at home if you live in Kankakee County? That is a great question. I think so send me an email um, and I can find out for you. So I think it was the Kankakee Soil and Water Conservation District. Here's my email address. Send me an email and I'm gonna find out if there's a land trust in Kankakee County doing it, okay? And we'll figure it out for you. Okay. Are the campanulas in the same family as bellflower? Yeah, so, so harebell, Harebell, yes, is, and there's an insane non-native European, some kind of creeping bellflower, I think is the name of it, that's super invasive. Yeah, they're in the same family and that's fine. This is the native version. Do you trim aster in late winter or early spring or just leave it? All right, so Pat, with the aster that I showed, the aromatic aster, I don't trim it at all because it, has a super mounted form that I love. So I don't have to do anything to it. There are some people who, um, oh, well, I do burn it. <laughs> when I just burn my gardens in general, um, it doesn't burn that well though, because it's kind of like a weird airy texture. Um, so if I don't like the deadness sticking up, I'll just cut it to 15 inches of a stem um, in the late spring, I guess, I don't know. I'm not crazy about that, like following a certain timetable. So I'll either leave it or I'll cut it if it's driving me crazy, but I'll leave the 15 inches. So if there is anything living in there, they're able to stay in there. Um, can I email the resources page? 
you can take a picture of it. Um, you know what, when I, when I do your follow-up email, maybe I'll just like copy and paste it into that. Okay. So you're, cause you're going to get a follow-up email with the, this recording. Okay. Yeah. Dutch hose are really nice. Will vile, will wild violets keep other native plants from growing? Great question, Allison. Ooh, I think I'm coming to do a site visit for you. No, they will not. Let's look at that garden. Okay, so the garden with the violets, here we go. This picture is the same garden. Oh, look, my dog's photobombing. Same garden as this. And my dog's photobombing that one too. So same gardens. No, they don't keep other plants from coming up. It's pretty amazing. But they do, before all the other plants are growing, they cover the surface of the soil, all right? So this is like April. This is like, I don't know, June probably, end of June or something. So two and a half months time difference here. And there are violets in this picture. Like you can see them underneath the prairie drop seed there all along the edge, there's a bunch of violets in there. Um, all the other plants just grow up right through them. It's perfect, I love it. And if the violets are like way too thick and you just don't like it, just move them. These are expensive. <laughs> They're expensive to buy them, okay? So like put them in areas where it's bare soil, just move them. And then they're gonna catapult their seeds and give you lots of free plants. Good question, Allison. Thank you for asking that. All right, let me see if there's any other questions. Oh, okay. Thank you, Janie. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, okay, cool. Janie, email me if you wanna talk. She works for a wholesale plant nursery. Give me a call sometime. Give me an email, we can talk about stuff. I do presentations for other groups as well. Um, okay, let me look in the chat. I think we're good. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. This was so much fun. I love this topic, talking about plants and gardens and how they function. Um, you're going to get this recording either today or tomorrow. If you've got questions, reach out. You want to schedule a site visit, reach out. We are booking up quickly. This is always an insane time of the year. <laughs> Find your local native plant sales. There's a ton of them around the Chicago region, okay, over the next couple months, like April, May, June. There's just like, it's like native plant palooza all over the place. Um, yeah. Thanks, guys. Find your land trust. Reach out, everybody. Have a good day. Bye.